1989, after 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Kent Hoven began the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism in Pensacola, Florida. In order to combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year, Creation Science offers four great tools to help strengthen the faith of believers and win the loss to Christ. The first tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hoven and his son Eric. For over 12 years, Dr. Hoven has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in nearly every state and over 20 foreign countries. Notice what the textbook says. Boys and girls, 30 million years ago. It means a fairy tale is coming next. 30 million years ago, these primates evolved. There's that word again, evolved. Then it says, they are ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans. Grandpa? <laughs> what big eyes you have, Grandpa. His fast-paced illustrated seminars cover such diverse topics as why the Earth cannot be billions of years old, why Adam lived to be 930, evidence that dinosaurs have always lived with man, lies in public school textbooks, where the races came from, and how evolution influenced the rise of communism, Nazism, and the New World Order. The second tool creation science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminars have circled the globe and reaped a harvest of souls for the Kingdom of Christ, as well as helped restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda they have been subjected to. These videos are available in English, French, Russian, Spanish, Japanese, and Sign Language. There are videos of live debates and many other topics as well. The third tool we make available is our website. DrDino.com has lots of information from charts and graphs to articles on a host of topics. Thousands visit our site regularly to gain insight into God's creation. Our fourth tool is the new and exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from across America to visit our museum, science center, and theme park where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson for everyone from 4 to 94. To find out how you can schedule a seminar at your church, or for more information on the materials we carry, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us toll-free in the U.S. at 877-479-3466. It was great in the earth, and the thoughts, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sounds about like today, doesn't it? And the Lord said, it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. He said, that's it, I'm going to wipe out the earth. I will destroy man. It repenteth me that I have made them. The earth was corrupt and filled with violence, and all flesh had corrupted his way, the Bible says. And God said unto Noah, I want you to build an ark. There's going to be a flood. So God decided, decided to destroy the world because of man's wickedness. The world had to suffer because of man's disobedience. So in 2 Peter, the Bible says, In the last days there shall come scoffers, walking after their own lust, and they're going to say, Where is the promise of his coming? For where, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Notice that phrase, willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. <laughs> the scoffers are willingly ignorant of two things. Number one, how God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth standing in the water and out of the water. We cover all that on video number two of what this phrase means, the canopy of water that was overhead. But the scoffers are ignorant of the creation. The second thing they're ignorant of is the flood. 
whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was completely wiped out by a flood in the days of Noah. So why would God use a flood? Why not just perform a miracle and say, <clears throat> okay, everybody except Noah, die? I mean, couldn't God do that? Sure. Why would God use a flood? I mean, that did make a mess out of the whole real, all the real estate, didn't it? Didn't it probably wreck Noah's house and everybody else's house if they had one, if you needed one back then? Why would God use a flood? Well, for one thing, there's several reasons why I think God may have used a flood. The flood left evidence where a miracle would not. Number two, the effects are here to remind us of God's judgment on sin. And number three, with a flood, there was a warning time when people had a chance to repent. God said, Noah, start building that boat. When that boat's done, folks haven't repented by then, it's too late. I mean, this was an obvious sign of God's mercy and His love and His grace. He wanted everybody. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance, the Bible says. So, what caused the flood in the days of Noah? We're going to cover that tonight. What about Pangaea? How many of you have been taught that all the continents used to fit together in one big supercontinent called Pangaea? Well, what about Pangaea? What does the Bible say about this? And where does the Ice Age fit into the Bible? And what froze the mammoths anyway, the big hairy elephants? And how did the mountains and oceans form? We're going to cover some of these tonight. This will not be very evangelistic, you know, uh, preachy kind of stuff, just mostly information to give you a new worldview to explain how the flood can explain everything we see in the world today. Why would the world flood suddenly? Could it rain enough to cover the whole world? Where did all the water go? I mean, it's, that's a good question. Where is all that water anyway? And what is the evidence? Well, let's talk about a few of these things tonight. What about Pangaea? You are taught in school that all the continents used to fit together in one big supercontinent. This textbook says, South America and Africa seem to be a perfect fit, right? typical textbook propaganda. They're going to say the shapes of the continent seem to fit. There are similar fossils on opposite sides of the ocean, and they're going to use magnetic lines at the bottom of the mid-Atlantic ridge. These are the three lines of evidence to support the Pangaea theory. Uh, there are some things they don't tell you. What they don't tell you, kids, in school is, in order to make the continents fit, they had to shrink Africa 40 percent. Hmm. They also don't tell you that Mexico and all of Central America is gone. Take a careful look at your Pangaea map and tell me, where is Mexico? Panama City, or Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, Nicaragua, where are they? <laughs> hmm, just flat gone, aren't they? They also don't tell you that several continents were rotated one way and another was rotated the other way. You don't just twist a continent around. They also do not tell you if you took the water out of the oceans, you would notice there is dirt underneath. <laughs> These continents are not lily pads floating around in a bathtub, folks. They are connected, <laughs> right? The earth has a solid crust to it. I think the kids ought to be told there's another way to look at this. It is true the earth appears to be cracked up. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, done that, seen it, have t-shirt. <laughs> But let's just look at the evidence they're giving and let's look at this from another side. I think kids ought to get educated, not indoctrinated. So let's just show them all sides of this Pangaea thing. You're going to be told in school that the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has magnetic reversals. Now watch out for this because this is simply not true. There are no magnetic reversals. By the time it ends up in your textbook, it shows like nice, neat lines of alternating polarity, the textbook will say. It's just not true, folks. That is a lie. Actually, and the experts will tell you, the magnetic crustal blocks do not represent reality. It didn't happen that way. What happened, as they checked along the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, they found areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. Not reversals, stronger and weaker. And so they made a sine wave, a stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker, as they dragged the machine across. Somebody came along and drew a line through the middle of the sine wave and said, everything below the line is a reversal. Well, that's simply not true. The line should have gone way down there. See, there are no magnetic reversals on the ocean floor. There's only areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. In Genesis 7, it says, the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. What I think happened to cause these magnetic anomalies down there the fountains of the deep broke open. The Bible says there was more water under the crust of the earth. We'll get into more of that later. When that water came shooting out to the surface, the earth ripped like seams on a baseball, 
and the crust above went sliding away, opening up a crack. As the water came shooting out, it would widen the crack and slide the continents away. They would be sliding down. As they slid down, the underneath part would bulge up. Now, the sublayer is called basalt. As it bulged up in the crack, it would, it would develop cracks in it, or fissures, which are going to fill in with water. Water's going to rush into the crack. Now, the neat thing about basalt, if it's very hot, it doesn't store a strong magnetic signature, whereas if it's cooled off, it stores a stronger magnetic signature. So all they were measuring was where the cracks are in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, stronger and weaker magnetism. They weren't measuring reversals. There aren't any reversals down there. The magnetic field does not reverse. There is no place on the ocean floor where a north-seeking compass will point south by the rocks down there. It just isn't true. So don't fall for that. The Earth is cracked up. That's not the question. But it, it didn't uh, happen slowly over billions of years. It probably happened during the flood. And the textbooks are going to say that the, the ocean floor is being subducted or recycled. This is also a very important part of the Pangea theory, and I'll tell you why. There's not enough mud in the oceans for billions of years of accumulation. See, when it rains, dirt washes off the hills and runs into the oceans. Eventually, it all ends up in the ocean. But there's only enough mud down there for a few thousand years' worth of erosion. So it's kind of an embarrassing problem. You know, if the Earth is billions of years old, why isn't there more mud in the ocean? So they come up with this theory of Pangea and the subducting of the continents to answer the embarrassing problem of where's the missing mud? They're going to say, well, it's being recycled. Well, I don't think so. Textbooks are going to say that the continents are moving away about as fast as your fingernails grow. Not too fast, right? There's no actual positive proof of this. There's some good theories, and the continents may be moving away. However, continental plate movement does not prove they've always been moving, obviously. It does not prove the rate has always been the same, and students should be told there are other options. There are some other options to explain this. I live just a few miles south of Interstate 10 in Pensacola, Florida, right there. Interstate 10 goes from Los Angeles all the way to Jacksonville. If I see somebody headed east at 70 miles an hour on Interstate 10, does that prove they started in Los Angeles four days ago? Well, no. They might have just got on at the last exit, right? And if you see the continents moving a little bit, that doesn't prove they've always been moving. They might have just started at the time of the flood in the days of Noah. Continental drift theory is important for the evolutionists because they're trying to avoid two embarrassing problems. Number one, the magnetic field of the Earth is getting weaker, indicating less than 25,000 years for the age of the Earth. So they have to get an answer. They'll say, well, it's reversing itself. No, I'm sorry, it is not reversing itself. Don't fall for that, okay? The simple fact is the Earth is not millions of years old. Secondly, there is very little sediment in the ocean, indicating only a few thousand years of accumulation. So that's why the continental drift and Pangea theory is really pushed on these kids. Not because the theory is reasonable, but because it answers some embarrassing problems and keeps them able to believe the Earth is billions of years old. Now, what about the Ice Age? Is, was there ever an Ice Age? I mean, did the ice come all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri? Oh, yeah. It really was an Ice Age, folks. Well, where does the Ice Age fit into the Bible? And what froze the mammoths? The big, huge, hairy, hippie elephants that are found frozen, some of them are standing up. Food still in their stomach, food in their teeth, undigested. What happened to the mammoths anyway? Well, I got curious about these mammoths. You know, in one year, I heard they took out 20,000 pairs of tusks. They go up there and dig them out. They call them ivory mines. Nobody knows for sure how many mammoths perished, but many experts estimate it could have been as many as 5 million mammoths perished around the polar regions. We find them all over in Florida. Of course, they're not frozen down there. They're petrified or coalified. But up around the North Polar region, some of them are still frozen. How many saw the news uh, was a couple weeks ago when they got the big giant mammoth completely intact and took it out of the ice? They're going to try to get mammoth DNA and clone it with an elephant or something. I hope they do. It'd be neat, okay? It wouldn't prove evolution, but it would be a neat thing. But what about these mammoths, anyway? What is the truth about this? They're found all over Siberia and, Russia and uh, Alaska. What happened to the mammoths? Well, the mammoths are frozen upright. A few of them are, not all of them. Their undigested food is still in their stomach and in their mouth. They died of suffocation. There is no water found in the lungs. So don't let somebody tell you they fell into a river and drowned. That is not true. 
First place, if you fall into a river, you don't freeze solid into a block of ice. It takes a long time to freeze because it might be 50 below outside, but once you get under the ice, it's 32 degrees. So they're not going to freeze. Ne next, there's small ice crystals in the blood indicating they probably froze in less than five hours. If they would have frozen slowly, the crystals would be bigger. So how do you freeze an elephant in five hours? I got curious about this, so when I get curious about something, I don't know any better than to start asking questions. I called everybody I, th I could think of that might have an answer. I wanted to see how long it would take to freeze an elephant. So I called bird's eye frozen food people <laughs> in New York. I really did. I called up, talked to one of the scientists there. I said, hello, sir, uh, if I stuck an elephant in the freezer, what would happen? <clears throat> he was silent on the other end of the phone for a few moments. Finally, he said, uh, you'd have a crowded freezer. I said, well, yeah, I know that, but uh, how, long, how long would it take to freeze an elephant? He said, well, meat freezes about 12 inches every 24 hours. And what's going to happen if you stick an elephant in the freezer, the outside is going to freeze and the heat is going to be trapped inside and the middle is going to rot out because the heat is trapped with an ice insulator around the outside. I said, well, that's not going to work because the mammoth I want to freeze, the elephant, I got to keep the food in his stomach still green, still fresh. And after he's dead, the stomach acid doesn't know he's dead. It's going to keep working. And so I need to freeze him in less than five hours. And I called physics professors and meat packing houses and bird's eye and everybody I could think of who might know. And the consensus of opinion was that if you want to freeze a mammoth in less than five hours, you have to put him in something about 300 below zero Fahrenheit, like liquid nitrogen. Well, it never gets 300 below zero here on Earth. I've got the map of the South Pole from National Pornographic, uh, Geographic, uh, over here. <laughs> the coldest temperature ever recorded is minus 127. That's pretty chilly, but that's not cold enough to freeze the mammoths. Where do you get something 300 below zero? Well, tonight I'm going to give you the Hovind theory <clears throat> of what I think happened. Now, I have to give credit to lots of other people. I've read so many different books from varieties of opinions on what caused all these things to happen. I've tried, tried to put it all together into one theory that makes sense to me. Now, maybe you've got a different theory. I'll, I'll listen to any theories you've got. I think what our job is, since this is a one-time past historical event, we can't prove any of it. We put the pieces together and develop a theory and see if it fits. So let's look at the Hovind theory tonight and see if it fits. But before I give you the Hovind theory, I need to review some science. There is a law in physics called the inverse square law, which basically says if two objects are attracted to each other, like two magnets or two planets with gravity pulling them together, the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In English, that means <clears throat> if you would half the distance, you would quadruple the traction. See, the Earth and the Moon are pulling on each other with gravity. If you brought the Moon into one-third the distance, you would take that one-third, inverse it, and square it. It would be nine times the gravitational pull at one-third the distance. Inverse square laws apply when you're dealing with forces involving gravity, light, magnetism, and girls. <laughs> when the distance is halved, the attraction is quadrupled. Now see, I travel every week. I've been home five Sundays, I believe, in ten years. I travel a lot, which means I get to come home every week. And when I get about 20 feet away from my wife, it's, hello, dear, how are you doing? When you half the distance, it's, wow, you looking good, honey. When you half the distance again, it's too late. <laughs> so <clears throat> the secret, fellas, is stay about 20 feet away, and that'll cause most of the problems to disappear. This is the inverse square law. Okay, the next thing to keep in mind, a spinning top behaves in a very particular way. Okay, if a spinning top is struck by something, It'll wobble around, and it'll recover spinning smoothly at a new, new angle. But as it wobbled, it followed a very predictable pattern. You can actually determine when a spinning object was struck by looking at the wobble that it does. If you graph it out over time, you can say, well, it was impacted about right there. Interesting, okay? The Earth has obviously wobbled. There are all sorts of measurements and indicators to show that the Earth has wobbled in its history. What caused the Earth to wobble? Stonehenge is a strange uh, solar observation point, apparently, built to study or worship the sun at summer solstice, but it doesn't line up today. 
Amun-Ra was built to study the sun, but it doesn't line up. George Dodwell, the famous Australian astronomer, got, got together all of the data on these solar observations, and he said, you know what, folks, it looks like something struck the earth and caused it to wobble. Probably wobbled for a thousand years or so, and finally stabilized, and today the earth is tilted over 23 and a half degrees. Well, George Dodwell got all this information together from the observations the ancient people made of the summer solstice, when it, the sun's as far north as it's going to get of the equator, which normally is June 20th or 21st. It varies back and forth from day to day, but normally the 21st. Okay? George Dodwell said that the graph that he made showed that the earth had wobbled, and he noticed the wobbling curve on his graph was exactly the same as a top struck by an object. It appeared to him that something struck the earth 4,350 years ago. Well, now, let's see. 4,350 years ago is about the time of the biblical flood. So what happened anyway? Could it be that something struck the earth to cause the flood? That's part of the theory I'm going to give you tonight on what caused the flood in the days of Noah. Today the earth is tilted over, and that's what causes our seasons. And the first mention of cold weather is in Genesis chapter 8, after the flood. They may not have had any cold weather. See, if the earth weren't tilted over, you'd have springtime all the time. It would still be a little colder at the poles and a little warmer at the equator, but generally springtime weather all year long if the earth weren't tilted over. So it could very, very well be that that's the way the earth used to be. The next thing to keep in mind, the moon has craters on it, but the craters are not evenly distributed. See, if the moon were hit by meteors just over random chance over billions of years, the craters would be evenly distributed. But they're not. It's almost like a catastrophe formed the craters on the moon. The same thing on Mercury. The craters are not evenly distributed. So what happened anyway? Mars has canyons on it that are bigger than Grand Canyon, and yet there is very little, if any, water on Mars. How do you get canyons, erosion canyons, bigger than Grand Canyon? Whatever used to be on Mars is, that formed all this erosion is obviously gone. There are no giant oceans there. What happened to form the craters on the planets and the canyons on Mars? Well, we'll cover that in the Hovind theory. The next thing you need to keep in mind, there is an effect called the Meissner effect, where two magnets will float. If one is placed on top of another, the magnet will float. How many have heard of what I'm you know, talk, talking about? That is called the Meissner effect, probably named after Meissner, would be my guess. Um, Next thing to keep in mind, there are comets flying around through space, and these comets are extremely cold. Oftentimes, comets are flying around, and they're three to 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Don't lick it. <laughs> I need to find out now if anybody is or was as dumb as I was as a kid. <clears throat> How many of you have a piece of your tongue stuck to a pump handle or a flagpole someplace in the world <laughs> right now? <laughs> you know? I got off the bus at school. My big brother said, hey, I bet you can't lick the flagpole. You know, some January day about 10 below zero. What's wrong with licking the flagpole? I can lick it if I want. <laughs> you spend the next 10 minutes crying for somebody to come get some water and pour it on your tongue, right? Well, super cold objects exist in outer space. Three to 400 below zero. Ooh, hey, now that's cold enough to freeze the mammoths. Normal 127 below zero is not cold enough. Okay? The next thing to keep in mind, if you throw a snowball too fast, it'll break apart in midair. You couldn't possibly shoot a cannon or shoot an ice ball or snowball out of a cannon. It would break apart before it made, that, made it out the end of the barrel. It just, there's a certain speed beyond which it will not go. It'll break apart. The next thing to keep in mind, the Earth has a magnetic field, and that's what causes the northern lights. As the energy particles from the sun strike the magnetic field, they are deflected, and most of them end up around the north and south pole. How many have ever seen the northern lights before? I've gotten to see them several times as I travel and preach. Just absolutely gorgeous watching the sky light up. If you've never seen it, it's worth going to see the northern lights. Next thing to keep in mind, the pre-flood world was a lot different than the world today. A lot different. The Bible teaches there was water above the atmosphere, probably a layer of ice held up by the Meissner effect. This was mentioned in Genesis 1, 6, and 7. It's mentioned in 2 Peter 3 and mentioned in Psalm 148, water above the atmosphere. So the earth was a lot different. The next thing to keep in mind before we give you the Hovind theory, there's a guy in the Bible named Peleg. Who was Peleg anyway? 
If you're reading Genesis chapter 10, I hate to say this about the Bible preacher, but Genesis 10 is a boring chapter. It's got all those big names in there that nobody can pronounce except Alexander Scorby. You know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he begat so-and-so, and you get all this begatting going on, and you come, come along reading, trying to do your daily duty and read a chapter a day to keep the devil away, and you get down to verse 25, and it says, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. This is the first time it makes a comment about one of these guys. Why does it say the earth was divided in the days of Peleg? And then it says his brother's name was Joktan. Well, Joktan means shortening. Peleg means divided. Joktan means shortening. What happened in the days of Peleg anyway? Well, we're going to get into that in the Hovind theory. What I think might have happened in the days of Peleg to divide and shorten, just like the Bible says. The next thing to keep in mind, the pre-flood world had a layer of water under the crust of the earth. This is mentioned in Psalm 136. It says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. There used to be a lot more water under the crust of the earth. That's probably what came shooting to the surface during the flood and caused everybody to drown. Most of the water for the flood did not come from the 40 days of rain. It came from the water that had been stored underneath, subterranean water chambers. Of course, there's still a lot of water down there. Next thing to keep in mind, there might be two ways to look at things. How fast was that calf going? If you remember video part number four about the calf puller. So we're going to give you the Hovind theory tonight. What happened anyway? What caused all this to... Uh, what caused the worldwide flood? I made a conscious decision years ago. I decided I'm going to believe the Bible until somebody can prove that it's wrong. I had some friends I went to school with. They decided they are not going to believe the Bible until it is proven right. Maybe you heard about the atheist. He came to the preacher one day. He said, Preacher, I don't believe anything in the Bible. He said, You don't? He said, I don't believe nothing except you've got to prove it to me scientifically. If you can't prove it with science, I won't believe it. He said, Preacher, if you can prove one verse scientifically, I will believe it. The preacher said, Well, okay. He grabbed the atheist around the neck and grabbed his nose and began twisting his nose back and forth. <laughs> Pretty soon the blood was pouring down the guy's face. He said, Man, what are you doing? He said, I was proving the Bible. It says, The ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 30. Anyway, <clears throat> I don't recommend you do that, but uh, it does say that, by the way. <laughs> what I'm going to do for the Hovind Theory tonight, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you, and then when we're all done, we'll leave. So first I'll tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you, and then we'll be done. That's supposed to be a good teaching technique, they say. A quick review. Let's go through it very quickly. Eight points I want to get across tonight about the Hovind Theory. Number one, Noah and his family got safely into the ark. Number two, a 300 below zero ice meteor came flying through the solar system and it fragmented and cratered the planets and caused the rings around other planets. As this ice meteor approached the Earth, it shattered because of the inverse square law and the speed building up. And most of the shattered snow fragments and ice fragments were sucked in around the North and South Pole because of the strong magnetic field of the Earth. Number four, the sudden dump of ice on the Earth caused the Earth's crust to crack, which released the fountains of the deep. It caused the earth to wobble around for a few thousand years, maybe a thousand years afterwards, and it caused the pre-flood canopy to collapse, and it completely flooded the world. So the water came from three sources, underneath, inside the crust, came from rain, and came from melting ice. Those are, that's part of the Hovind theory. Number five, during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals would settle out in great swirling piles, you know, as the water swirled around, you would get fossil graveyards. And the plants would pack and get buried into seams, and they would become coal later on, and you'd get fossil graveyards and coal formed by the flood. Number five, during the last few months of the flood, the earth, which had been cracked up now, the plates were unstable. These plates began shifting around and tilting, maybe plates as big as Texas, maybe plates as big as America. They would shift and tilt. As one place goes up and another place goes down, the water's going to rush off, carving Grand Canyon in a few hours water rushing off through soft sediments. Number seven, over the next few hundred years, the ice caps would slowly melt back. That would raise the ocean levels, make the oceans deeper, colder, and wider, which would divide the earth up into the continents we see today. 
And number eight, the earth today still shows the effects of that horrible flood that destroyed the world. So that's the Hovind theory. Let's go back and hit a few high points now. Noah and his family got safely into the ark. Genesis 7, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou... Well, let me stop right there. God did not say to Noah, Go into the ark, did he? He said, Come into the ark. Now tell me, where does God have to be in order to say that? In the ark. That'll preach, brother. There's a whole lot of comes in the Bible. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1.18. I think you ought to go through the Bible and study all the comes, and then you ought to come to Jesus if you're not saved. He loves you. He wants you saved. He wants to put his yoke on you. It's easy. It's a wonderful serving God in this life. Just come to him with your problems. He'll take care of them for you. Anyway, the Lord said, Come into the ark. And so all the critters went in, two of each kind and seven of some. And then the Lord shut the door. That's a good eternal security verse, by the way. <clears throat> when God shuts the door, it won't leak. People say, Brother Hovind, you believe you're eternally secure? Yeah. I got born into God's family, and He is stuck with me. Now, some of God's children, He takes them home and crowns them. Other children, He crowns them and takes them home. <laughs> but if you're saved, you are eternally secure. You are going to heaven. Okay. So what happened is 300 below zero ice meteor came flying through the solar system, and it began to break apart as it came through the solar system. Fragments began to hit the planets. Chunks of ice would hit Mars. Now, Mars gets pretty hot in the daytime. And so the ice would melt, and there would be floods all over Mars, but then it's going to vaporize and disappear. It would drift off, lost in space. So the flooding happened on Mars, causing these giant canyons, uh, probably at about the same time as the flood, as this catastrophe affected the whole solar system. As the fragments of meteor came flying through, some of them would get trapped in the spin of the planets in the gravitational pull, and they would become the rings around the planets. At least four planets have ice rings around them. Where did this material come from? The fragments on the planets are rings of made of rock and ice. Interesting. Could have happened at the time of the flood. Number three, as this meteor approached the Earth, or pieces of it approached the Earth, or maybe we, we just went through the tail, through a debris tail, I don't know. Regardless, though, I believe a whole lot of ice was sucked into the North and South Pole because of the Earth's strong magnetic field. Super cold ice is slightly magnetic, and it is easily statically charged. So those are two factors that might have sucked it into the North and South Pole, causing it to be dumped on the pole. As the meteor came flying in through space, it broke apart out in space, and the fragments would generally go to the pole. That would cause the Earth to wobble for a few thousand years. You have a spinning object, and you're going to dump a bunch of weight on there. If it's slightly off-center, it's going to create the wobble effect. As this ice meteor came flying in, it broke apart and sucked around the poles and dumped on the North and South Pole. Now, when you get 300 below zero ice, you're going to freeze the mammoths standing up. This sudden dump of ice caused the crust of the Earth to crack. And the fountains of the great deep were broken open. Water came shooting up to the surface, and the earth was totally covered by water. Up near the North Pole, they find frozen bobcats, frozen camels. Camels don't live near the North Pole, folks. All sorts of frozen animals. It's not just frozen mammoths. Strange things up there are found frozen. And when they drill through the ice, oftentimes under the ice they find coal. Well, coal is made from plants. This map of National Geographic's South Pole here says they had the dirty diamond mine dug here in 1962, which yielded anthracite coal. Well, since coal is made from plants and there are no plants on Antarctica, we have to have a, we have a problem here. How do you get coal in Antarctica? Hmm. Admiral Byrd said he reported seeing palm trees under the ice when he got down near the South Pole. Well, palm trees don't grow near the South Pole, folks. We have a hard time getting them to grow in Florida because we're too, I mean, in North Florida because it's too cold for palm trees. You sure don't get them to grow at the North Pole. They find thousands of dinosaur fossils found 400 miles from the South Pole. Dinosaurs are found. Dinosaurs live on plants, most of them. And there are no animals down there that have, like a dinosaur, no reptiles, that's for sure. Thousands of well-preserved leaves found in Antarctica, this article says. 250 miles from the South Pole. Thousands and thousands of leaves that still retain their original cellular structure. They're pressed, squeezed into, into layers. 
There's a scientist had a theory that he thinks the Earth is still being hit by ice meteors. And by the way, it was vindicated several years ago when they noticed there are chunks of ice as big as houses hitting the Earth every day. There are still fragments of ice flying around through space. Now they hit the atmosphere and vaporize and come down in the form of water. But if you look at the Earth, you notice it has two North Poles. We have a real North Pole and we have a magnetic North Pole. How many have heard of that before? Your compass points to the magnetic North Pole. Now, right here in Missouri, they line up pretty good, so you don't have to worry about, you know, adjusting your compass. But if you lived in Alaska, there's quite a difference between real north and magnetic north. And you'd have to allow for that, especially if you're an airplane pilot and it mattered, you know, which way you're going. This ice age appears to be centered around the magnetic north pole. So here's what I think might have happened. The mammoths are chomping on their tropical flowers. It was a nice day outside. All of a sudden, it began to snow. They had never seen snow before. So one of them said, Herman, this is peculiar weather we're having here. It's snowing. Ooh, that's cold snow. That's 300 below zero Fahrenheit. Or maybe they used Kelvin or Celsius. I'm not sure what mammoths used. But anyway, he said, that's cold. Let's get out of here. So they began running around, and the snow got deeper and deeper. And pretty soon they got trapped in snow drifts, standing up. And they couldn't even fall down. Have you ever been in snow so deep you could not even fall over? You ever seen that before? You're stuck standing up. You can't even fall down. And as this snow got deeper and deeper, it began pushing out toward the equator, and it would uh, carve out glacial effects. There were chunks of ice as big as Texas sliding across the countryside at 100 miles an hour, scratching out glacial grooves, which are found all over the northern and southern latitudes of the Earth. These glacial grooves where rocks were slid, sometimes for miles, scratching the rock. And the ice came all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri, and the Earth was totally covered by water, some liquid, some solid but still water, because that canopy had collapsed. See, when cold air hits regular air, it makes it rain. So the cold spots on the North and South Pole would send out a cold front. You ever open the freezer and see the cold air come flying out, you know, or falling out? That's what probably happened. The cold wave hit the regular air, and it rained, collapsing the pre-flood canopy, which completely covered the Earth. The Bible says, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. If you ever get a chance to read the book of Jasher, somebody sent this to me. Brother, it is amazing reading. You ever seen that book of Jasher? It's referred to twice in the Bible, as it says in the book of Jasher. In Jasher chapter 6, it says, On that day the Lord caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the foundations of the earth were broken up. Now, it's, not, it's an extra-biblical book. It shouldn't be part of the Bible, but it's very interesting reading from an ancient source about what the flood was like. Okay, next in the Hovind theory, this dump of ice on the North and South Pole would cause the crust to crack, spreading ice would carve the glacial effects, it would bury the mammoths, and it would cause the Earth to wobble, and it would destroy the pre-flood world. The canopy collapsed. Genesis 9, the Bible says, "...all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered." It was a worldwide flood. Did you know if you shrank the earth down to the size of a cue ball, the earth would be smoother and rounder than the cue ball. And all the, if you shrank it down to the size of a 12-inch globe, all of the water in the world would not even fill one tablespoon at that scale. I mean, the oceans look huge, but folks, compared to the size of the earth, there's just not much water here. One tablespoon to a 12-inch globe is what you would have. Now, Mount Everest is interesting. At the top of Mount Everest, it's covered with seashells, clams. I've got one on the table down there. Petrified clams in the closed position. Now, in the first place, I would like to point out, Mount Everest is a little ways from the beach. <laughs> Secondly, clams do not climb mountains very well. Thirdly, when a clam dies, it opens right away. You can come to Pensacola, go down to see the beach there, and walk along the beach and pick up a whole trainload of seashells. But you're never going to find a closed pear if it's dead. It'll open right away. The muscle relaxes, and something eats the muscle out. You're lucky to find a matched pear. You never find them closed, unless they're still alive. The only way to get petrified clams in the closed position would be to bury it alive. There are some places where the clams are found petrified in the closed position, and there are layers of them ten feet thick. Solid, petrified clams. Hmm, interesting. 
Genesis 7 says the fountains of the deep were broken up. I think the earth got struck by something, maybe a junk of chunks of ice coming in from the north and south pole, and that caused the earth's crust to crack. And the fountains of the deep went shooting out. And the earth today still has the scars where this happened. The cracks are called the fault lines. As the hot water came shooting out, it would kill all the fish and other things within a certain effective radius. As this water came shooting out along the seams, it's going to erode the sides of the crack and push them away. That's going to let the layer underneath bulge up, making them slide away even faster. So what you would end up with is the bulging effect of the basalt, it's called, lifting up, cracking, explaining the magnetic anomalies, and the surfaces are going to slide backwards. As they slide back, they're going to eventually stop, like pushing a carpet on one end, it's going to wrinkle up at the wall at the other end. And the wrinkled mountains we find all over the world indicate they were compressed from the end, not lifted up from underneath. It was a compression going right to left. Interesting. Why do we have these mountains like that? And this hot water shooting out from inside the earth would kill the diatoms. Diatoms are itty-bitty glass-bodied critters that live in the ocean. They make their body out of glass, silica. When they die, the body falls to the bottom. And then the kids fall to the bottom, and the grandkids, and the great-grandkids. They say it takes about a thousand years to get an inch of diatoms, because they are extremely tiny. Under a microscope, they're beautiful, but they're really tiny. When this stuff dries out, they call it diatomaceous earth. Has anybody ever heard of diatomaceous earth before? They use it for all sorts of things. It's used for swimming pool filters, detergents, fertilizer, soundproofing, kitty litter. You know the white rocks you put out for the cat to go potty on? That's diatomaceous earth. Oil dry. When you spill oil on your driveway, drop out diatomaceous earth crystals. It soaks the oil right up. It's used for all sorts of things. Well, the largest diatomaceous earth quarry that I'm aware of is in Southern California. Lompoc, California is right smack on top of the San Andreas Fault. And right there, the diatomaceous earth is 1,500 feet thick in places. I've been to see the quarry, talk to people that work there, took, took, took quite a tour of that place. In 1976, they were digging for diatomaceous earth, just scooping it out with machines. They found the fossil skeleton of a baleen whale. They find billions of fossils in the diatomaceous earth. But this day, they found a whale. The whale was standing on end, 80 feet long. Now, the layers of rock are tilted with the whale, so really the 80 feet's not the problem, but the 8-foot thickness is the problem of the whale. If it takes a thousand years to get an inch of diatomaceous earth, don't you think that whale would rot in less than 50 or 60,000 years? Animals that die today in the ocean, they, they don't fossilize. They get scavenged. They get ripped apart. Something's going to eat them. They dissolve. The only way to get a fossil whale packed in diatomaceous earth, preserved, would be to completely bury him very rapidly. I think what happened, the water came shooting out, hot water, killed all the diatoms within a few hundred miles maybe, and it snowed diatoms to the bottom. It was a very rapid accumulation because of that worldwide flood. When I was out there, one of the foremen there gave me this chunk of diatomaceous earth. It's about maybe one foot square, but it contains hundreds of fish fossils in one square foot. He said, we find fossils here all the time. He said, one time we were digging on the night shift, and they had all these spotlights set up. He said, we found a 60-foot wingspan pterodactyl. But we didn't stop and tell anybody, because if you tell some university, we got a fossil here, they're going to make you shut down production while they come dig out their fossil, and you're going to lose money. We're here to make money, so we just dug right through it. But they find all sorts of fossils out there. Call them up and ask them. You'll see, they always find fossils by the trillions. In in Dover, England, they find chalk that is three feet thick. I'm sorry, 300 feet thick. Solid chalk. You can break up your yard and write on the chalkboard with it. The word Cretia is Latin for chalk, and that's where we get the word Cretaceous Age, the chalk age. Hmm. What happened? Did all the critters decide to go to England to die to make the layer of chalk for us? Or could there have been a catastrophe? Rapid change of ocean temperature. I believe that's what happened. Genesis 7, the Bible says the waters prevailed. I mean, that world was destroyed by the flood. So point number five in the Hovind theory, during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals settled out. Moving water is going to make them swirl in little eddies, as they're called, and great piles of dead animals and plants are going to accumulate. In some layers, they're going to make coal seams. Other layers are going to make fossil graveyards. 
moving water automatically separates particles based upon their density. You ever seen those things you can buy at the store with two layers of glass and different color sand in between? When you flip it over, it makes all these strange patterns. Notice it always makes layers. Interesting. That's what the flood would do. The flood formed all those layers quickly, not millions of years of accumulation. And as these animals swirled around, they would begin to rot, and the head falls off, the tail falls off, the ribs fall off, and you end up with a dinosaur graveyard, fossil bones tangled up, obviously twisted, contorted positions, disarticulated, meaning they're not put together, and there's no teeth marks. He wasn't chewed apart by a scavenger. He rotted and fell apart, probably during the flood. They find a concentration of fossils was remarkable, like logs in a log jam. Billions of fossils are found. The evolutionists aren't having a hard time finding fossils. They're having a hard time finding missing links between the different kinds of fossils. That's where the hard time comes in. I was in a debate one time, and this professor said, we've got proof for evolution. We found a fossil over here that's a missing link between this animal and this animal. I said, well, sir, I'd like to point out something. Uh, if you find a fossil in the ground, all you know is it died. You don't know if he had any kids, let alone different kids, right? Secondly, I'd like to ask the question, how come that fossil is able to do something that the animals today cannot do? You're claiming this bone in the dirt can produce an animal different than itself. Why don't the animals today ever produce something different than themselves? Mm -hmm. It's always the long ago and far away it happened, but we don't see it happening today. I think the fossils form because of this flood. We can go all day on instances of fossils that are found in twisted, contorted positions. In a Belgian coal mine, they found thousands of iguanodon skeletons, dinosaur skeletons. Hundreds of dinosaur track sites, that's the footprints, are found all over the world, well-preserved track sites. Some places they find more than a thousand footprints together. In the Karoo Formation in Africa, they found 800,000 million fossils of vertebrate animals, animals with a backbone. 800,000 million. In uh, Axel Island, in, up near in Canada, they find petrified redwood tree stumps. Well, first place, if you look at the background there, there are no trees growing on Axel Island, especially not redwood trees. They require very special climate to grow. Very few places can grow redwood trees. And here they are in Canada, way up near the North Pole. So in the Hovind theory, petrification can take place very rapidly. Animals have to be buried, and they can petrify in less than 100 years. Here's a petrified water wheel. The water kept running over it and turned the wood into stone. Here's a petrified fish giving birth, petrified as the baby's being born. It doesn't take millions of years to be born. Praise the Lord, right? Here's a petrified cowboy boot with a leg still in it. The boot manufacturer said that boot was probably made about 1950. The cowboy's leg is still in it. Apparently, he got his leg shot off or torn off or something happened, and it turned to stone. It's petrified, folks. Here's a petrified hat found in New Zealand. Don't let them tell you it takes millions of years for things to petrify. A little kid in Arizona sent me a petrified crayon that he found. <laughs> Petrified. In uh, Tennessee, Gainesboro, Tennessee, a man died in 1881. They buried him. Fourteen years later, his wife died. They were going to bury Grandma. They dug the hole, and water soaked into the hole. So they dug a hole on the other side, and water soaked in. And so they buried Grandma someplace else. Well, the grandkids got worried about Grandpa being buried in this water, and so they had his body taken out of the grave, and they found out his body had completely turned to stone. He had petrified in 14 years, being in running water. Petrified human. Occupants of the coffin had turned to stone, this article says, as a result of continual flow of water, perhaps minerals in it, over such long periods of time. Things don't take millions of years to petrify. It can happen very quickly under the right conditions. You kids are going to be told in school that each of the layers of the earth is a different age, and they're going to tell you that the fossils are sorted based upon how they evolved. Simple at the bottom, complex at the top. First place, they're not sorted that way. And it's silly for creationists to argue that they are because they're not sorted like the textbook says they are. And evolutionists admit it. They say, look, David Ropp, who's a strong believer in evolution, says, I don't know why you guys argue about the sorting because they're not sorted neatly. 
But if there is any sorting to the fossils, it's because of the moving water. Water separates these things. See, the way they date the fossils is by which layer they come from, and the way they date the layers is by which fossil they find in the layer. Circular reasoning. We covered that in videotape number four. Moving water is going to automatically sort things. Now, kids are going to be told that clams evolved first, and so they're going to be put at the bottom of the geologic column. Well, now, kids, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Uh, it could be the animals are sorted with clams at the bottom and birds on top because they're sorted based upon their habitat. Uh, when a flood starts, clams are already at the bottom. Aren't they? Wouldn't they be likely to be the first ones buried? Wouldn't the birds be generally be the last ones buried in a flood because they could fly around till they run out of gas, right? Maybe they're sorted based upon their intelligence. As best anybody can figure out, clams are not too bright. Maybe they're sorted based upon their mobility. Did you know clams cannot run very fast? <laughs> Maybe they're sorted based upon their body density. Did you know a clam shell is a little heavier than a bird feather? No, don't let them tell you that they're sorted based upon evolution. They're sorted based upon a flood. Genesis 7 says, The high hills under the whole heaven were covered, and the mountains were covered. The earth was completely covered. Hugh Ross and his followers are teaching everybody that it was just a local flood in the days of Noah. Well, I'm sorry, Hugh, if the mountains are covered, it's no longer a local flood. Secondly, I'd like to point out, why on earth would God tell Noah to build a huge boat and fill it full of animals and stay on there for a year if it's just going to be a local flood? Why not tell Noah to move? Hmm? I can figure that out. I'm sure God could figure it out. And why, why save any animals if it's just a local flood? There's animals other places of the world. No, it was a worldwide flood. And I, I, Hugh Ross, God bless him, I'm sure he's an extremely intelligent man, but some of the things he teaches are just plain heresy. You ought to get the book we have called Creation and Time and see what Hugh Ross really believes. And it's tragic that some major Christians have swallowed in, in, into Hugh Ross's teachings and had him on their Christian TV programs and everything else when he does not believe what the Bible says. He might claim he does, but he does not. It was not a local flood. It was a worldwide flood. So where did all the water go anyway? If there was a flood, where did all the water go? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the water's assuaged. The word assuage means to drop or sink straight down. Now, some newer versions of the Bible have messed it up. They say the water's receded. Oh, no, no, the water assuaged. That's a very important difference. It drops straight down. Psalm 104 tells us about this. It says, The fountains of the earth, God laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. What I think happened was, during the last few months of the flood, the plates of the earth were broken up, and they were unstable, and they began t tilting and shifting. As one place goes down, another place is going to come up, and the water's going to run off into the low place. Because the earth's crust was cracked up like an eggshell, and it began to shift around. That's going to cause Grand Canyon to be formed very rapidly. We'll see more about that in a little bit. Psalm 104, verse 7 says, At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. The water <laughs> rushed off of the high spots. Verse 8 says, They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. Now, this is an old English phrase, and most Bibles have a footnote right there that says what this really means is the mountains arose and the valley sank down. So what happened during the flood, the thicker spots of the earth lifted up and the thin spots sank down. See, the earth's crust has very thick places under the continents. It's about 30 miles thick where we're standing. But if you go out into the oceans, the crust is only 3 to 5 miles thick. Continental crust is very thick. Oceanic crust is very thin. So the thin spots would sink down making someplace else lift up, and the water would rush in. And so the earth is all cracked up into plates, and it still is today, and the plates are still moving a little bit, but that's all because of the flood 4,400 years ago. If you push in on one place of the earth, someplace else is going to bulge up, sort of like a waterbed. Anybody ever slept on a waterbed before? If you wait till your wife is sound asleep on her side of the waterbed, you tiptoe into the room, get a chair, and jump up as high as you can, <laughs> and land flat on your side. <laughs> You can launch her almost to the ceiling. 
because when one place goes down, pff, something else has to go up. So that's what happened to the earth during the flood. As it got twisted and shifted around, it began to wrinkle up like a raisin, and the water began to rush off of the rising mountains. Now, if it ran off quickly, you would get rapid erosion. If it ran off slowly, you would not get as much erosion. It would just simply have to do with how much water and how steep the ground is. Very simple. All the erosion effects you see out west, as you fly out over the western part of the United States, it's like, man, look at these huge erosion features. And yet, it hardly ever rains out there. You go to the Badlands, and it hardly ever rains, and yet there's erosion all over the place. What happened? Well, I think that happened as the flood water ran off. It didn't happen slowly over millions of years. The mountains lifted up, the water rushed down into the low places. And it's interesting, if you look at a map, the mountain ranges follow the coastlines in almost every case. The Rocky Mountains are parallel to the Pacific. The Andes Mountains are parallel to the South Pacific. Even the Appalachians are parallel to the North Atlantic. It's like the mountains and oceans formed at the same time. And all over the world we find bent rock layers. Now, I don't know if you realize it or not, but rock doesn't bend very good. And these bent rock layers indicate they were all bent while they were soft mud. They didn't bend slowly. They bent quickly while they were still soft mud layers. That all happened at the time of the flood. As the mountains lifted up, it's going to cause metamorphic rock to be formed from the pressure on some of these sedimentary rocks. It's going to change them. And at the same time, as it cracks, you will get igneous intrusive rock squirting up through, like the quartz seams going through the limestone all over Arkansas. So after the flood, the water ran off into the oceans, but the oceans were smaller than they are today. I believe when Noah got off the ark, the oceans were much smaller, making the continents much larger. That's probably the beach out there, folks. England and Ireland were not islands. They were part of France. See, if you lower the water just a few hundred feet, um, everything's connected. English Channel is only 150 feet deep at the deepest point. 150 feet, you know the length of this room? That's the deepest point in the English Channel. It's 30 miles wide, but only 150 feet deep. If you lower the water a little bit, Russia and Alaska are connected by a gigantic land bridge. Everything in the world becomes connected. Florida was about 1,000 miles wide. You could actually walk and hop over the creek to Cuba. Then you could hop over the creek and go to Yucatan, Mexico. Maybe the Gulf of Mexico was backfilled. As the oceans filled in later, the water would rush backwards into the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So they were filled backwards by the rising water. We'll talk about why the water rose later. But Florida would be real wide. See, the oceans have two parts to them. There's the deep part called the abyss, and then there's the shallow part called the continental shelf. I believe the continental shelf is probably the old beach line when Noah got off the ark. So they could walk any place in the world. You could walk to Australia. People say, how did the animals get to Australia after the flood? Oh, they hopped or walked or crawled, whatever they do today. That's how they got there. They had a few hundred years before they were divided. We'll talk about that later. So what made the oceans fill in? Why did they fill in? And why do we have this continental shelf? And what happened in the days of Peleg, anyway? The Bible says the scoffers in the last days are ignorant of the flood. The flood explains the geology, folks. And we're going to take a quick break here, and after the break we'll cover some more on what happened in the days of Peleg and what caused the continental shelf to be formed and the oceans to fill in and coal to be formed, and show you what happened at Mount St. Helens just 20 years ago, which is powerful proof of how things can happen very quickly. We'll give some more on the Hoven theory and tie it all together and then show how it applies to you today and to me today. Good spiritual application here coming up right after the break. All right, let's continue now with the Hoven theory. What caused the flood in the days of Noah, and what is the evidence? And all this kind of things we've been covering about the mammoths and the Ice Age. The Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. And our founding fathers had this as a basic principle, that they were created by God, and that rights come from the Creator, and they're unalienable. You can't put a lien against them. 
What we've got today is a generation of people that have been raised believing in evolution, which says rights come from the government, instead of believing that rights come from God. And it makes a whole different philosophy that students live by. What we're going to cover here is a little bit more about the flood and the effects that it had. But what I'm trying to do, though, is get across a basic philosophy that we need to live by. God created this place. God destroyed it with a flood. This is his world. He can wreck it if he wants. And he's coming to judge it again. And if you're not saved, the Bible says you're going to hell. I mean, that's what it says. Whether you like it or not, that's what's going to happen. Now, before the flood came, the world was a lot different. People lived to be 900. After the flood, things changed. That flood was a major event in world history. And we need to understand what the flood did, or you won't understand the geology of the world today. Lifespans dropped off quickly after the flood because that canopy had been destroyed. So back to the Hovind theory. We're on point number six. During the last few months of the flood, the unstable plates of the earth shifted. This would cause thin spots to sink down, thicker spots would lift up, and the water would rush off, forming Grand Canyon, probably in a few weeks, not millions of years of erosion. If you shrank the earth down to the size of a cue ball, as I mentioned, it would be smoother and rounder than a cue ball. It's almost perfectly smooth for its size. The 20-mile bulge, because of the spin, is insignificant on an 8,000-mile earth. From space, you can't even find Mount Everest. It's a five-mile tall mountain, and you can't even find it. You can't find the Rocky Mountains either. They're insignificant compared to the size of the earth. So. As the water went rushing off, it would cause enormous erosion. We see erosion marks all over the world in areas where there's very little rain. I was in Lompoc, California, driving along the countryside, and there on the side of the, of the road, there was an erosion mark that had happened just in one rainstorm. I walked up closer and took some pictures of it. You can see a miniature badlands that happened after one rainstorm. Washed out the dirt. The central part of the United States, where the purple area, or lavender area is here, is the Mississippi drainage basin. Now, Chicago is only 600 feet higher than New Orleans. I mean 600 feet, two football fields. That's the elevation above sea level that Chicago is. New Orleans and Chicago are 920 miles apart, which means the Mississippi River drops 600 feet in 920 miles which means the Mississippi is dropping eight inches per mile. That much drop in a mile of run. Pretty dead, close to dead flat. Mississippi slowly flows down to New Orleans. Now, if you built a dam across the Mississippi Valley, it would flood the entire lavender area there. You'd have to have a huge dam, of course, 600 feet high and extremely wide. But uh, if you built a dam across Grand Canyon, it would flood the area you see right there behind Grand Canyon. A huge dam would form. Textbooks are going to tell you kids in school that the Grand Canyon formed slowly over millions of years. This book says, over millions of years, the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. I was in a debate one time with this atheist, and he said, uh, Mr. Hoven, obviously it took millions of years to form the Grand Canyon. I said, well, sir, I've been to Grand Canyon, flown over it many times, studied it quite a bit. There's some things you need to know about Grand Canyon. Did you know the top of Grand Canyon is 6,000 feet above sea level, and the bottom is 1,800 feet above sea level, almost one mile deep? That's a big hole in the ground. But the river enters the canyon at 2,800 foot elevation, and the river flows downhill as the dirt goes uphill, because the river's going down and the mountain's lifting up at the same time. And it ends up at 1,800 feet elevation when it gets to the highest point of the Kaibab uplift, which is 6,000 foot average. This uh, picture here, the snow line, kind of tells the whole story. The Grand Canyon is actually a, a dam that was broken, or breached, as they call. The canyon flows through the middle of an old wrinkle in the mountains called the Kaibab uplift. So I told the professor, I said, sir, did you know the top of the canyon is higher than the bottom? He said, well, yes. I said, sir, did you know the river only runs through the bottom? He said, well, obviously. I said, sir, did you know the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon? 6,000 is more than 2,800, isn't it? By a long shot, isn't it? I said, sir, rivers don't flow uphill. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. 
The flood had to make Grand Canyon. Those canyon features were formed quickly as the water went roaring through there. See, Grand Canyon, even the textbooks will admit, Grand Canyon is kind of puzzling because it loops back and forth. But it also has steep sides. Those are contradictory features. Looping back and forth, like the Mississippi River, means it's on a low gradient. It's not moving very fast. And so it loops back and forth. Steep sides indicate rapid moving river or uh, high slope is young river or rapid movement. Hmm. Grand Canyon has both loops and steep sides. So the scientists are kind of puzzled. You know, how did Grand Canyon form? How did the river do that anyway? Well, that's the whole problem. See, the river didn't do that. The flood made Grand Canyon. That canyon could not possibly have been formed by the river. See, a catastrophe can change the real estate in a hurry. Here's a building half sunk into the mud because in Japan they had an earthquake. When the ground shakes, water comes to the top. And the top 500 feet of mud will become, or land will become like soup, and buildings sink in. The Alaskan earthquake in 1964 really messed up the real estate. I was staying in a motel up there in Alaska, 30 feet away from where the crack was for the last earthquake in 1964. I was on the 13th or 14th floor. Look out the window and you can see where the ground dropped off 30 feet. They just smoothed it out, planted grass, and went on about their business. But it, uh, earthquakes can really change things. When Mount St. Helens blew in 1980, as soon as it began to blow out the top, within a few seconds, the whole north side of the volcano slid down. As this mud went sliding down at about 100 miles an hour, it uncorked the volcano and the steam and ash came shooting out. My sister lived about 60 miles from there when it happened. They got ash all over everything from this volcano blowing. Here's, you see the picture of the ash blowing out of Mount St. Helens. That ash, boiling hot clouds of ash, went shooting across the countryside and killed 60 people, as well as who knows how many critters. Here's a car buried in ash up to the window. Pretty hard on the paint job too, by the way. As this ash went flying all over the place, scientists began seeing how far it was going. Some of it completely circled the globe in the wind currents completely around the world. Now, the most of it, though, landed in this yellow shaded region here, covered hundreds and thousands of square miles of land. And Mount St. Helens on the far right was a one cubic kilometer ash cloud, real tiny compared to big volcanoes. You should see what the big ones do. It was considered a tiny volcano, but the ash that came flying out stratified into layers. As this mud went sliding down the side of the volcano, it did some strange things. The hot mud went sliding down and dammed up some creeks and rivers. It actually filled in the whole valley with hot mud. There's a semi-truck just about buried in mud. I got to see the house where the family built the A-frame house, and they were just, just ready to move in, and the mudslide came through, and now their house is filled up halfway full of mud, and all you see is the top floor sticking out of the ground. They decided uh, not to move in. But, as the mud flowed down, you can see the satellite image here, or the picture, how that it flowed across the Toodle River. Now, junks, chunks of ice as big as houses were blown off the volcano, and they were covered up by the hot mudslide. When you get hot mud on top of ice, you're going to have a problem, because when ice turns to water, it's going to shrink a little bit, but then when it turns to steam, it's going to expand 1,700 times, and nothing is going to stop it. So these chunks of ice melted and vaporized and exploded under the mudslide, and it had steam explosions. They actually thought the volcano was going off again, but it was the chunks of ice exploding under there. When it exploded, it blew out great big holes, and the mud slumped back in, and it made erosion marks all around the side of these steam explosion pits. Now, I guarantee some professor is going to bring his students here someday and say, boys and girls, you see all this erosion? This took millions of years. And some kid's going to say, no, my daddy saw this happen. It took about five minutes, teacher. You're not allowing for a catastrophe. The Toodle River was actually dammed up. Now, I've been there several times. I don't know why they call it a river. I mean, it's about as wide as maybe from here to the Oregon. Okay, I would call it a creek where I come from, but they call it a river. The mud flowed across and stopped the Toodle River from flowing. Well, this mudslide filled in the valley. Several days later, there's a huge lake backed up behind it. As soon as that water got deep enough to go over the top of the dam, the mudslide, it washed it out. Rapid erosion took place. The mud built up, built up in the valley, and then the water built up behind it, and when it got going over the top, 
they started carving gullies, and pretty soon the main one took over and the water went roaring through there, and it picked up all sorts of debris, sand, gravel, logs, tree stumps, and it became like liquid sandpaper. It went roaring through the crack and it carved out a massive canyon 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep, and 2,000 feet long, and it carved it out in about 15 minutes. And at the bottom, you will see a little tiny creek flowing through there called the Toodle River. <laughs> now, if you think that little river made that big canyon, you are mistaken. That was done in one big catastrophe. See, when, once water starts going over a dam, erosion takes place very rapidly, and canyons can be washed out very quickly. That's what happened during the flood in the days of Noah. If you're willing to look at the world from a creationist perspective, it makes a whole lot more sense. The flood formed these features. Go to Montana and look at Dry Falls, Montana. I think they said it's about a thousand times bigger than Niagara Falls, but there's no water going over it. Completely dry. Dry Falls, Montana. Go check it out. This canyon that formed near Mount St. Helens, when they went down inside it to look at this canyon, they noticed the sides of it are all layers, stratified. Thousands and thousands of layers of strata. Now hold it, all that mud washed in there at one time, and the canyon was carved out at one time. Why would you have thousands of layers of strata? Well, you can get a jar of dirt, put some water in it, shake it up, and set it down. It'll settle out into layers for you in a few seconds, folks. You can watch it happen in your hands. As the mud was flowing in, it automatically separated. Now, I guarantee some professor is going to bring his kids here someday and say, boys and girls, each of these layers is a different age. And this represents 50 million years right here. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, professor. This represents one mudslide. In a few minutes, the rapid erosion took place on the north side of Mount St. Helens. And that little river at the bottom did not form the erosion marks. And the little river at the bottom of Grand Canyon did not form Grand Canyon either. It just happens to flow through the crack, that's all. The Kaibab uplift, you can see, it was just, it's a breached dam, folks. That's all it is. It happened very quickly. So many trees were blown down when Mount St. Helens erupted. It was incredible to see how many trees were there. I flew over it a couple years after the eruption. My brother-in-law was a pilot. We flew down inside the volcano, flew around, flew over. There were trees laying every place. Now, if you've never been to Oregon or Washington to see the giant trees on the West Coast, you won't know what I'm talking about. But these trees are gigantic. Some of the trees are eight foot in diameter. Anybody ever been to Washington or Oregon and see those massive trees out there? In the Midwest, you just can't appreciate the size of those things. You need to go see them. But the trees were blown down and they laid every place. I sat on the airplane next to the, one of the vice presidents from Weyerhaeuser Lumber Company as I flew back from that area a couple months ago. He said, Brother Hoven, uh, do you want to know the difference between government property and private property? I said, yeah. He said, well, when those trees were blown down in Mount St. Helens, we owned about half of the property that was destroyed. The government owned the other half. They decided to let nature regenerate on its own. You know, a bunch of tree huggers went out there and said, oh, we need to save these dead trees. Let's let them lay there. Don't bother the trees. So we went out and picked up all the dead trees on our property and planted new trees and started growing again. He said, since they did not clean up their area and plant it, Erosion washed off most of the topsoil, and the ground is basically ruined. Today, their trees are about three feet tall, 20 years later. He said, in our area, we cleared out the debris and planted new trees, little bitty ones, seedlings, and today they're 20 feet tall. He said, our area looks like a very rapidly growing forest, and theirs looks still devastated 20 years later. See, the environmental movement, folks, is not about saving the environment. It's about Karl Marx's communist plank number one, abolish private property. God told us we're supposed to be the stewards of this earth, and it's okay to cut a tree down. One guy was getting all upset. He said, trees have rights. <laughs> I said, well, sir, I believe oxygen molecules have rights too, and you ought to quit breathing. <laughs> How far do you carry this anyway? It's a tree, man. Cut it down and plant another one if you'd like. But they hauled out logs out of this. I heard, somebody told me they hauled out 900 truckloads of logs every day for nine or for six years. I don't know if that number's right, but they hauled out millions of trees and they got less than 10% of what was blown down. It was unreal, the devastation from that one volcano blowing the trees down. It blew so many trees into Spear Lake, you could actually walk across the water. 
Thousands of trees were floating in Spirit Lake. Two thousand acres of lake was covered with wood. None of the trees grew there. As these trees were floating back and forth, the wind blew them back and forth and uh, rolled all the bark off. Of course, we'll show you pictures of that in a minute. It moved the log mat from one end to the other of the lake and back and forth. It's still there today. Go out there right now. It, the logs are still floating in Spirit Lake. It's been over 20 years, and they're still there, some of them still floating. Many of the logs began floating in the upright position. The root end, generally the root end, is pointed down, and these logs are floating just barely above the surface. Many of them began to sink to the bottom and get stuck in the mud. Some of the logs are already 15 or 20 feet deep in mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. It looks like they grew there. They did not grow there. Those trees are being buried in mud, and if that area ever dries out, the trees are going to petrify standing up. Petrified trees standing up, running through many layers of earth, are found all over the world. It's a very common feature. It's called a polystrata fossil. Petrified trees standing up. This had to form during the flood. It did not form over slow, long eons of time. Now, if that tree ever gets the dirt washed away from it, it's going to fall over. Here it was petrified standing up, and petrified trees standing up are very common. Here's me standing by some in Yellowstone National Park. They find 27 consecutive layers of petrified trees in the vertical position, running through different layers. Some people try to say each layer is a different age. No, this all happened at the time of the flood, as the log mats were floating back and forth. The flood lasted a year, you know. Thousands of feet of sediment would be deposited. If the tree ever falls down, though, when the dirt washes away, it's going to break when it hits the ground. I don't know if you've ever cut down a tree for firewood or not, but if you cut down a tree, it does not break up into logs for you automatically. <laughs> How many notice that phenomenon when you cut the tree down, okay? And yet petrified trees that are broken up into logs are found all over the world. I believe it was Arizona where they took one of the petrified logs, rolled it over, and there were chop marks on the other side. Somebody had begun chopping that tree before it fell down. While it was un unpetrified, obviously. Here are some scuba divers going underneath the floating logs in Spirit Lake. You can just see their heads in the foreground here. They saw under the logs that the logs had been rolling back and forth and all the bark rolled off. All that bark and debris settled to the bottom, and there's a three or four foot thick layer of bark at the bottom of Spirit Lake. That bark is going to get covered up with layers of mud, and it's going to turn to coal. Coal is obviously formed from plant de de debris, vegetation, unburied under pressure. Coal can be made in one hour in the laboratory. They take plant material under pressure and heat and convert it to coal in one hour. I think after the flood, the deeper layers were buried, uh, and they were pressed and turned to coal probably in maybe a few hundred years. But during the flood, that log mats from the destroyed forest would be floating around, and they'd be leaving a debris trail behind them. Maybe a huge log mat as big as Texas would float by. Then two weeks later, there'd be some more mud on top as the sediments settle out. And then the trees float back and leave another trail of debris, and they eventually get buried into what we call strip mines for coal. Do you have coal around here in Missouri? I'm from central Illinois, and there's just all sorts of coal mines. And I remember as a kid, my dad would always take us out to the coal mines, and we would watch the machinery and study and pick up fossils and stuff associated with the coal. Coal is nearly all, always found in nice, neat layers. I debated Dr. Eugenia Scott on the radio one time, and she said, uh, Dr. Hoven, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. If you look at the amount of coal in the world, the entire biomass of the world today could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. There had to have been an enormous amount of time laying down the seams of coal. Oh, sorry, Jeannie, you got a problem in your philosophy here. It's true there's 80 separate layers of coal, and it's true there's not enough trees to make all the coal. That's, she's right. However, she is assuming the world before the flood was like it is today. See, the world today is 70% underwater. Suppose the world before the flood was uh, only 20% underwater. It was mostly land, and suppose it had hyperbaric conditions, extra air pressure, extra carbon dioxide, and the trees were enormous every place. A lot of the world today is not only underwater, so more of it's under ice, and more of it's under desert. It's just not livable. Very little of the Earth's surface is habitable for man, only about 
I don't think that's the way God made it. Today we live in a destroyed world. But the original creation was a lot different. So I think what happened, that pre-flood world had a lot more trees. Lots bigger trees, and that's what formed the coal seams. Branching coal seams are frequently found. They drill down, hit coal. Drill down through dirt, hit more coal. But when you trace the coal seams, you know, several miles away, they connect together. Branching coal seams prove the layers are not different ages. They all happened at the same time. Some places the coal is 100 feet thick. That would take a lot of trees to make all that coal. And in the coal, they find human artifacts, like this bell found inside a lump of coal. Newt Anderson found it. He's got it sitting on his desk. Call him up. There's his phone number. A bell inside a lump of coal. This uh, vessel was found in solid rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. What looked like a spark plug was found encased in solid rock. They found a small gold chain inside a lump of coal in Illinois 100 years ago. A carved stone was found in a coal mine in Iowa. An iron cup found in a coal mine in Oklahoma. The sole of a shoe was found in a coal mine in Nevada. Broke open a piece of coal, and there was the sole of a shoe in there. You could still see the stitching. See, even the twist of the thread was visible. They said the rock was 213 million years old. No, it formed during the flood. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the waters assuaged. It says the waters returned from off the earth continually. Now, this is a neat phrase. The waters returned. In the Hebrew, it's halak vashub. The water was going and returning. Going and returning, like sloshing back and forth. Hmm, interesting. I think during the first part of the flood, of course, the sediments would settle out horizontally. Layers always form horizontally when they're settled out of water. And then the Bible says the mountains arose and the valley sank down, so the earth wrinkled up, maybe for several factors, maybe the sliding from the uh, crack widening at the, as the basalt bulged up, or maybe just the wrinkling effect as the water underneath goes to the surface, the rock's going to settle down in at different rates and wrinkle up. But this is going to cause erosion. The waves were going back and forth across the ocean then, and they would wipe off the surface and deposit new layers on top. So you end up in, in geology what is called an unconformity. You end up with an unconformity with layers at strange angles to each other. It didn't happen over millions of years. It happened during the flood. Just like the Bible says, the scoffers are ignorant of the flood. Then the Bible says, the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. Seventh month. No, it didn't get out till the 13th month. Probably for several reasons. Number one, it wasn't dry, still muddy out there. Number two, it wasn't safe. The water's still sloshing back and forth. Number three, there's nothing to eat outside. It would take a while for things to grow. He stayed in six more months. By then, there's enough vegetation and stuff growing that the animals could survive when they went out. Genesis 8, verse 5 says, The waters decreased continually. Here's the Hovind theory. These giant ice caps would slowly melt back. As they melt back, it's going to do three things to the ocean make them bigger, or wider, deeper, and colder from the added melting ice. If you lower the oceans just a few hundred feet, Australia is connected to Vietnam. You can actually walk any place in the world, folks. They're all connected by these massive land bridges. So if you trapped all that water in the form of ice at the North and South Pole, the ocean level would be lower and you could walk any place. So for the first few hundred years, they were able to walk around the world. You could go any place you wanted. They were all connected. As the ice melted back, it left behind the drumlins and terminal moraines and all that kind of, all the glacier effects, they really happened, but it was not millions of years ago. The valleys were formed as the ice melted back. And then it says in Genesis chapter 10, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Now, Peleg was born 100 years after the flood. So I think in the days of Peleg, that's when the earth was divided, like the Bible says. There are several theories about what this means. Some people think the earth was divided by languages and nations at this time. Could be. That's a reasonable theory. Some people think the continents moved and split up to form from Pangaea. I don't buy that theory. For one thing, if you move a continent one foot, it causes an earthquake and a tidal wave that kills everybody on the world. So I don't think that's what happened, but some people do teach that. 
Some people think the waters came up and divided the high spots into islands and continents. As the ice melted, the water would come up. Some people think the land was surveyed in the days of Peleg, and that's what it means the earth was divided. Maybe a combination of all of those, or at least three of them, is probably what happened. I don't know. As the ice melted back, that runoff is going to fill in the oceans, making them deeper, wider, and colder. And that storing of the CO2 in the water is going to remove the greenhouse gases and cause more radiation to get in, which is going to shorten your lifespan. Because now you get more radiation. Probably the lifespans were shortened for several reasons. The old English Channel there is only 150 feet deep, folks. 30 miles wide, 150 feet is nothing. You know, the length of this room. It's not very deep. I believe as the oceans filled in, it backfilled the Mediterranean Sea, went rushing through over the, where the Straits of Gibraltar are. When the Mediterranean got deep enough, it would backfill the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. This happened from the rising oceans as the oceans filled in more from melting ice caps. Just the Hoven theory of what might have happened. But there's the continental shelf, I think, is the old beach line way out there. And lastly, the earth today still shows the effects of God's judgment. God apparently hates sin. You can see things around you that ought to remind you of God's judgment. When you look at the canyons, when you look at the gasoline and then get out of the gas can or out of your pump to fill in your car, that's a result of God's judgment. Some animals and people died in that flood and their bodies were converted to oil or gas under the great pressure of being buried down there. Coal, the electricity we're burning right now has probably come from a coal plant, a coal burning power plant from the judgment of God. Herd of dinosaur bones was found. Now the textbooks are going to tell the kids this was millions of years ago. No, this is evidence of the flood. Even the headlines ought to remind us of God's judgment on sin. When you look at the earth from a Christian perspective, you can see, though I like the beautiful canyons, folks, basically it's wasted real estate. And it's evidence of God's judgment. God sent a flood to leave evidence behind. We can see he destroyed this place. And if you're willing to look at the karst topography and the oil fields and the coal fields from a Christian flood perspective, it all makes sense. There's a great book by Walter Brown that we sell called In the Beginning. Slightly different view than the Hoven theory, but I'll get him converted before it's over with. But he has some really good stuff on there. Let me leave you with a couple of thoughts here. This is a picture of a fish fossil swallowing another fish. Either that or the little one is a dentist. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, neither one of the fish thought they were going to die that night. The big one had the little one about halfway down, and I think the flood came, and the fountains of the deep broke open, and probably a mudslide covered them up. And they both woke up dead. Did you know you're going to wake up dead one of these days? And you're going to be dead for a long time. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Harry Truman, uh, not the president, Harry Truman lived on the side of Mount St. Helens. A friend of mine from St. Louis witnessed to Tim, to Tim Barron's, witnessed to Harry Truman. He said, Brother Hoven, Harry was a very profane man. He cursed every other word. He listened carefully to the gospel and then rejected what I had to say. He turned Jesus down. Sometime after that, the government came in and said, Harry, we believe this volcano is going to explode. You need to move. Harry lived right on the side of Mount St. Helens. Harry said, I'm staying right here. I'm not moving. Well, Harry did stay right there. Matter of fact, he is still there someplace. They never did find him. Probably buried under 300 feet of mud about now. Harry heard the warning and refused. As far as we know, Harry's in hell right now. Now, isn't that stupid to live on the side of a volcano that's about to explode, and somebody comes and tells you, uh, would, you would you move? You say, no, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. I mean, that's, you, that's not too bright, is it? But you know, there's an awful lot of people in America doing the same thing, and people in the world doing the same thing. Here we are living on a planet that's going to be blown up. It's going to be burned. It's going to be destroyed. We're all going to die. And Jesus has provided a way of escape, so you don't have to pay for your sins. You can be forgiven. And they're refusing to take the opportunity to be saved. I don't understand that kind of thinking or lack of thinking. 
The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus, you're just not going to heaven. God's not willing that any should perish, it says in 2 Peter. He wants everybody to be saved. None of this predestined stuff. He wants everybody to be saved. You can be forgiven. If you'll ask God, He'll forgive you. The Bible says in Matthew, Like it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know what drives me to travel and preach and keep going, brother? God hates sin. He hates my sin. He hates your sin. And I'm trying to persuade people to give their heart to Jesus Christ. That's what drives me. I want to persuade people. The Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. And I want to be wise. I want to win others to Christ. During the Civil War, actually it wasn't the Civil War, it's Abe Lincoln's War. <laughs> There's a long story about that. But this big old country boy from Alabama decided he's going to sign up to go fight the Yankees. So he went off to boot camp, got his training, got his backpack, got his rifle, and got his uniform, and he just went out to join the rebel army to fight the Yanks. He showed up at the battlefield and said, Sarge, I'm reporting for duty, sir. Sergeant said, Son, we're glad you're here. We need recruits bad. He said, Son, now listen, the Yankees are right over there, dug into a trench, and we're dug in right here. Your job, son, is to march right here in the trench. I want you to guard the trench. He said, Sarge, I didn't come to march in the mud. I come to fight Yanks, and they're right over there. Can't I please go fight them? Sergeant said, No, son, you don't understand. We haven't got orders yet. You march in the trench right here, and they're marching in their trench over there, and when we get the orders, then we can go fight them. Well, the big old country boy, was getting, he was getting madder by the minute. He didn't come to march in the mud. He come to fight Yankees, and they're right over there. Why can't I go fight the Yanks? But he did just what he's supposed to do. He marched back and forth. After a while, though, he just couldn't take it anymore. He could see the Yankees. He come to fight them, so why not go fight them? He just lost control, dropped everything, jumped up out of the trench, and ran, screaming and yelling, across no man's land, straight for the Yankee trench, all by himself. A one-man rebel charge. The Yanks were stunned. They said, what is the matter with this guy? Is he trying to commit suicide or something? That old country boy ran all the way across no man's land and jumped into the Yankee trench. Picked up the first Yankee he saw and boom, knocked him out one punch. He was a country boy. He'd been toting, hey, he's in good shape. You know, bam, knocked that Yankee out. He grabbed his prisoner, climbed up out of the trench, and ran back across for the rebel trench. Nobody dared shoot now, you know. He jumped into the rebel trench. All the rebs gathered around and said, what is that? He said, uh, that's a Yankee. <laughs> they said, well, yeah, we know. Where'd you get him? He said, I got him over yonder. He said, there's a whole bunch more over there. <laughs> he said, uh, y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. <laughs> y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. You know, preacher, I think an awful lot of Christians are going to get to heaven, and they're going by themselves. They've never led a soul to Christ. And they're going to get up to heaven, and they're going to see somebody else who's got a whole crowd gathered around them. They're going to say, hey, where'd you get all of them? And somebody's going to say, oh, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and yet have wanted one. Question, who are you bringing to heaven with you? Who are you bringing with you? Have you led anybody to Jesus? I mean, it's not that hard. Jesus is coming quickly. You ought to lead somebody to Christ. You might say, I don't know how. Well, I didn't know how at one time. I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. When I got saved, I started riding the bus to a little right-wing, radical, temperamental, independent, fundamental Baptist church. And I was reading my Bible, and I was growing in grace and learning more about the Bible. And one day, one friend of mine who went to a Presbyterian church. He said, Kent, how would you like to come with me to the Heart of Illinois Fair? They've got a booth set up there for the Campus Life Organization, and we're trying to win folks to Christ at the carnival, at the fair. I said, yeah, I'd be glad to, but I don't know how to win anybody to Christ. I mean, you know, what do you do? He said, you don't need to worry about that. Your job will be to take a questionnaire 
and go out into the crowd and say, would, sir, would you take a minute and fill out this questionnaire? Or ma'am, and if they fill out the 10 questions, the last question says, would you like to get to know God better? And if they said yes, my job was to bring them to the back of the tent and open the tent flap and say, Herman, this is George, he would like to get to know God better. And I was to bring people to the soul winner. Simple enough. I was having a wonderful time. First two nights, I was out there bringing folks to, bringing them back to the soul winner. On the third night, I was doing my, doing my thing, you know, inviting, having them fill out the questionnaire, bringing them back and introducing them to the soul winner, bringing people to the soul winner. Third night, this big old football player from Richwoods was out there in the crowd, and I said, hey, sir, uh, would you like to get to know God better? He said, yeah, I sure would. I said, come with me. I'd done it before, you know, no big deal. I got that big old football player. We walked to the back of the tent, opened up the tent flap. There was nobody there. I later found out they were down trying to win the Siamese twins to the Lord. One night, they, Lonnie and Donnie, Siamese twins at the fair, one of them got saved. The other one didn't. So they decided the next night to go down there and disciple Donnie, I believe, got saved first. And they were explaining to Donnie about the rapture. <laughs> Lonnie, of course, is sitting right there. <laughs> he says, what's going to happen to me? Well, you're going to have a problem, aren't you? He says, man, I better get saved, hadn't I? Yeah, you better get saved. And so the other one got saved the next night. But anyway, all I knew was the soul winners weren't there that night. I opened the tent flap, and there's nobody there. So the big old football player looked at me, and he said, what do we do now? I said, well, um, um, I guess I'll show you. I had never led anybody to the Lord in my life. Didn't know how. We sat down in the metal chairs in the dirt in the heart of Illinois Fair. I didn't know what to do. So I pulled out of my pocket a tract, God's Four Spiritual Laws. I, I just read the whole thing to it. I didn't know what else to do. I just read the whole tract. You're a sinner. Law number one. Law number two, you know, Christ died for you and wants to save you. I went through the four spiritual laws. I read page after page after page. When I got to the last page, it said, if you would like to receive Christ, please pray this prayer. So I said, would you like to receive Christ? He said, yes, I would. I said, oh, brother, what do I do now? I got him on the hook, and I can't land him. I said, well, it says pray this prayer, so uh, let's pray. I said, let's close our eyes, bow our heads, and I'll pray first, and you repeat after me. We closed our eyes, bowed our heads. I kept one eye open. I read the prayer off the track. I didn't know what else to do. So I read the prayer. You're a sinner. I said, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I know you died for me. I want you to save me. And he was repeating all this after me. When we got all done, leading him through a simple prayer to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. And by the way, that's all it takes to get saved. Don't let anybody add anything to it, okay? God's not willing that any should perish. He looked up, and tears were coming out of his eyes. He said, Kent, I've been worried about dying for the last couple of weeks. He said, Thank you so much for showing me. And he left. I've never seen him since. But I got down on my knees in the dirt beside that metal chair in the heart of Illinois Fair after leading my first soul to Christ. I said, Lord, uh, it's me, Kent. I said, Lord, I've only been saved a couple months. I'm 16. I don't know what you want for my life. I don't know what you want me to be. I, don't, I just don't know, Lord. But Lord, if it's okay with you, I'd like to do this the rest of my life. I just want to bring people to Jesus, Lord. Would that be okay with you? And it's been 31 years now, and guess what? I still like bringing people to Jesus. Some of you are here tonight, and you're saved. You've never done that. You've never brought anybody to Jesus, have you? You could. You could, if you weren't so worried about the dumb ball game going on. See, the devil has you distracted on things that are not going to matter. What you ought to do is focus on what's going to matter forever. And that's not money, that's not cars, that's not clothes, that's not ball games, that's souls. Preacher, we need some soul winners in this country. 
You think there's any lost people within 10 miles of where we're standing? Probably. Some people say, well, man, if I go around witnessing to people, I might drive them off. Well, what are you going to drive them to? Hell number two? <laughs> there's only one, you know. Witness to them. There's a simple way, there's a rule of thumb I use to determine if I should witness to somebody. I check and see if they're breathing. <laughs> you can put your hand like this. If you feel the air on top of your thumb, witness to them. If they're not breathing, don't witness to them. <laughs> That's, everybody ought to hear the gospel, folks. Jesus is coming quickly. Hey, if you died tonight, where would you go? Hmm? You're going to be dead for a long time, you know. You better get pre prepared for that. Where would you go if you die tonight? If you're not sure you're going to heaven, you ought to get saved. God's judgment. He and folks, it's evident every place. He ruined this world once, and He's coming to judge it again. And we're all going to stand before God. And it's, praise God, I've got the blood of Jesus Christ taking care of my sins, or else I'd be in serious trouble. If you don't have Jesus taking care of your sins, well, then you are in trouble. But He loves you. He's willing to save you. See, we're all going to die. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen to you too. And you're going to be dead for a long time. Where are you going to be when you're dead? Or if you're saved, what are you going to have to show for your life? Huh? You're going to leave it all behind? Why don't you take somebody with you to heaven? If you can't get you a big one, get you a little one. But get somebody saved. Everybody ought to win somebody to Christ. If you don't know how, learn how. If you're scared, pass out tracts or leave videotapes or do something. Everybody can do something. Boy, that flood ought to remind us of God's judgment. Ought to motivate us to get busy and lead others to Christ. I pray that you'll do just that. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask Him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6.23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now, and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help.